سنه بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم Peace and blessings be upon you, dear brothers and sisters uh, who are joining us. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are glad to be with you on this day. Um, topic of our discussion today is where are we standing right now? Uh, inshallah, looking at the history of uh, the movement of Imam uh, Hassan al-Mushtaba and the continuation of this path to the Qiyam of our Imam Hussein alayhi salam and connecting it, trying to um, test and figure out uh, what, is, what are the similarities comparing and contrasting today's situation with then and uh, figure out where are we standing today. Alhamdulillah. We are joined by Sheikh Mahdi Taib from the holy city of Qom in adjacency of the shrine of Lady Fatima Ma'asuma. Salamu alayha. We ask him to pray for us there and remember all of us there. One of the great teachers in Islamic seminary, as well as uh, dear Sheikh Muslim Mahdi Shawla from uh, the city of, from state of Virginia in the United States. Uh, so uh, inshallah, we're going to start our discussion uh, in a minute. Before that, if you have any questions throughout the uh, session, throughout this panel discussion, make sure you comment below uh, this video under the chat page, or you can go to the slido.com and uh, the code for this meeting is F213. The slido code for our meeting is F213. So inshallah, let's start with uh, our panel discussion today. Um, looking at the history and uh, the piece of Imam Hassan al mushtaba uh, the treaty that he signed with Muawiyah versus the Qiyam of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Do you see any difference in the socio-political uh, approach of these two Imams? Do you, is there any difference that we can draw? Um, starting with a respected Sheikh Mahdi Ta'ib. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Um, dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I'm honored to be uh, with you tonight to inshallah discuss the mentioned topic and inshallah to try to shed some light on the hidden aspects of the history of Islam and make a comparison between the, the, the two history, between the history of Imam Hassan al mushtaba alayhi salatu wa salam and Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam and also a comparison between what happened there uh, and what's happening today and what we're, we are experiencing today and with the time of the Imam of our time, inshallah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think for us to understand um, a good comparison, for us to be able to make a good comparison between these three different periods of times, our time, the time of Imam Mushtaba and the time of Imam Hussain we have to understand the history of Imam Mushtaba and Imam Hussain And once we understood these two periods of time uh, correctly, properly, uh, and in depth, inshallah, if we have a correct understanding of our time and uh, the philosophy of Islam and the doctrine of Islam, then we can make a good comparison. However, Understanding all of this uh, needs um, at least at least ten sessions. And now we, Alhamdulillah, have um, another one of the scholars, one of the teachers in America, who's also going to shed light on this uh, issue. But uh, based on my very limited knowledge, I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about the history of Imam Mushtaba and Imam Al Hussein Alayhi Salatu Wasalam to be able to uh, understand. Uh, what was going on at that time? Why was it that Imam al mushtaba came to what the brothers said, uh, peace treaty, which really wasn't a peace treaty. It was just a peace agreement. It wasn't a treaty. And to the, and to the Qiyam of Imam al Hussein and inshallah, uh, come to our time. Uh, once the Prophet of Allah, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, started his movement, 
after he received wah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in um, the mountain of Hira. In that cave, when he was sitting, when he was worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he received words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is your mission to go and bring justice to people. It is your mission to go and free people. The Prophet of Allah uh, started a movement. For 13 years, he was trying to establish a government. For 13 years, he was in Mecca. For three years, he secretly invited different groups of people to Islam. And after three years, he proclaimed his mission and he invited everyone. So for 13 years, his movements went on and on until he emigrated to, to Medina, where he established his government. So before this uh, uh, immigration, we have a movement from Rasulullah and the companions of Rasulullah, those who joined Rasulullah and said to the Islam, convert to Islam. And in Medina, they turned this movement to a government. So the result of this movement became a government. But after the demise or shahada, martyrdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and after the government of the Khurafa al-Rashidin, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam, Imam Hassan became the caliph. I'm using the terminology that Muslims understand. He became the caliph for us. He's always been the imam, and he was the imam at that time as well. But Muslims uh, saw him as, as their own caliph. At this time, Amir al-Mu'mineen was fighting with Muawiyah. He was martyred, and now it's Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba to finish, it's on his shoulders to finish his father's movement, his father's mission, which was eradicating Kufr, which was fighting against Kufr, which was fighting against, against blasphemy. So he continued the path of Amir al-Mu'mineen in fighting with Muawiyah. But because he did not have enough good followers, trustworthy followers, faithful followers, he got to the situation where he realized and he always knew that there are spies around him and a lot, a lot of these people have fallen for dunya. Dunya has mesmerized them. They've gone to the other side. Although they're in the army of Imam al mushaba but their hearts are with Muawiyah. And even if he continues his battle with Muawiyah, they will be facing Imam. And the Imam has to face them and they will kill the Imam and Muawiyah in return will say Hassan al mushtaba was killed by his own people. Then after killing Imam al mushtaba by the hand uh, of his own followers, he will attack the followers of the Imam, that's the, the people of uh, Kufa, and he will also kill them. And that will be the end of the history of Islam because they will finish everything. Because Muawiyah, we all know, he did not believe in Islam. Although in public he would practice certain uh, practices of Islam, but in heart they never believed in Islam. Although in their times they said, Aslamna. They accepted Islam after the conquest of Mecca, not before that. After the Prophet of Allah uh, achieved the victory and, to, and, and took over Mecca, well, a lot of people... Uh, accepted Islam and repented and they were told the Prophet of Allah freed them. Abu Sufyan was one of them. He fought with Rasulullah to, to the last minute that he could after he realized he can't resist anymore, he accepted Islam. So these are the people who entered Islam in this way. They never believed in Islam in the, in, in Allah and in the oneness of Allah in the way the Prophet of Allah taught them, in the, in the way the Prophet of Allah preached them. So now it's Imam al mushtaba knowing that Muawiyah is on the other side. And Muawiyah is a man who in public is a Muslim. He never sins in public. He doesn't go against Islam in public. Yet he, he teaches things that are against Islam. It's interesting that you see uh, once he called people to pray Friday prayer on Wednesday. And the interesting thing is that people believed in him. They, has, they had accepted him as a ruler, as a Muslim, as a caliph, to the extent that they accepted. They performed 
Friday prayer, Salat al Jum'ah. On Wednesday, not even thinking and realizing that, hey, this is not Friday. This, the, the, the title of this mansek, uh, um, as we say in Islam, uh, is this Salat ritual. Cool. Imam al Mushtaba accepted this under certain conditions. Under certain conditions. Imam al Mushtaba said, I'm not going to do bay'ah with you. That's one condition. And if you go to the history books, it's very difficult to collect all of these conditions because they're not mentioned in one book all in one place. You have to collect them from here and there. Imam al Mushtaba put some conditions and Muawiyah accepted. One is that we're not, I'm not going to do bay'ah with you, nor Imam al Hussein. We, our family, our people were not going to going to do bayah with you. One, two. After you, I will be the caliph of Muslims. And if I'm not alive at, at, at that time, Imam Al Hussein will be the caliph at that time. Three, the tax of Medina and this area will come to us for us to take care of people. Four, you shouldn't do lahn of Amir al-Mu'minin anymore in Nimba or anywhere. Six, you shouldn't oppress the people. And there are other conditions as well. Muawiyah accepted all of them. So Imam al mushtaba never did bay'ah with Muawiyah. You see, people, meaning Muslims at that time, they accused the Imam that you are a coward. They called him a coward. They said, Ya mudhill al-mu'mini, You have belittled us by accepting to do peace, to have peace with Muawiyah by giving up and fighting with Muawiyah. Imam al mushtaba stopped fighting with Muawiyah. Why? Because he did not have enough faithful followers. In one phrase, Imam al mushtaba when they talked really back to him, he said, he mentioned uh, a, he, a phrase which was taken from the Holy Quran from verse uh, 111 in Surah Al-Anbiya, you never know what happened. Maybe, maybe it's a trial for you and an enjoyment for a short period of time for Muawiyah. Why? Because Imam al mushtaba didn't give up, didn't stop. This was his tactic to get this movement again closer to an Islamic government. As we mentioned, the Prophet of Allah started a movement and he managed to establish a government. But now this government has collapsed again. It's gone. It's turned to a movement. Imam al mushtaba needs to go one step back and get enough followers, make his network stronger, and come back and establish the Islamic government. In a hadith, in Usul al Kafi, uh, volume number one, uh, page 368, hadith says, Waqqata hadha al amru fa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a time for the final government, for the universal government, to be at the year 70 after Hijrah, after the immigration from Mecca. Because they were trying to achieve that goal to turn this movement to a government again, Imam al mushtaba needed this treat, needed this peace agreement to go one step back and, and re-team, team up again and, and bring everyone together and strengthen the, the bonds of the Mu'mini, work on their ideology, make him faithful, and again go forward for, for establishing a government. Sheikh Mahdi, here's a question. Um, and that is, uh, inshallah, we, we get uh, benefited from uh, Sheikh uh, Muslim Shaullah. And that is, uh, you said uh, you, that this is a treat. This wasn't a treaty, rather it was an agreement that uh, made um, that had serious achievements and victories, including the conditions of that agreement um, caused the Mavia to limit themselves and um, to uh, restrict some of the actions that they were doing at that time, including uh, cursing upon Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali alayhi salam. 
I want to turn uh, to Sheikh Muslim Shola and, say, and ask him, what do you think uh, on this matter? What do you think was how this agreement um, in reality affected the um, history of Islam? And how did it prepare the society for Karbala? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa bihi nasta'in innahu khayru nasir wa mu'in. First of all, I am also very much grateful to all of you for giving me this opportunity to be among you uh, to discuss one of the very important topics discussed throughout the history of Islam because there are many ambiguities in terms of uh, what we call peace treaty took place in between Imam Hassan and uh, Muawiyah. So uh, very beautifully, Sheikh Mahdi, uh, he has explained uh, the bigger picture in which Imam Hassan was uh, taking the Ummah to. So um, in terms of the entire purpose of Imamat in the absence of Nabuwat or in the succession of Nabuwa is to establish the society which is built upon the peace and justice and the divine values. So therefore, when we talk about the trajectory of Imams, especially the transformation of Imamat of Imam al-Mushtaba to Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada and the difference of strategy in between both of them, uh, many of the Muslims, they have misunderstood and part of that misunderstanding is the propaganda of Banu Umayyah and the bias reports of the history. That is a separate topic which needs to be discussed in its length. And as it was said earlier that to discuss the life of Imam Hassan and Mustaba, uh, a number of sessions and lectures are needed to be delivered. Uh, however, in this very short um, session, I would like to begin with drawing your attentions towards the environment or the circumstances of, uh, of the time in which Imam al-Mushtaba uh, became the caliph or, or, or assumed the office of the Imam. Because um, it is very obvious for the followers of Ahlul Bayt Imam is Imam and no one in word appoints him as Imam. It is a divine post. It is a divine designation. And Imam is Mansus min Allah. And Imam is appointed and authorized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after the martyrdom of Imam Amir al-Mu'minin it is very important to look at the circumstances in which Imam al-Mushtaba was living. And if we understand that, we will be very much able to appreciate the, the benefit of that agreement made in between Imam al mushtab and Muawiyah. So as all of you are aware, and uh, uh, it is mentioned in the history, and uh, history uh, clearly mentions that after the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, uh, majority of Muslims, they were, they were ready to pledge their allegiances to Imam al mushtaba except the parts of the Levant or or the territory which was ruled by Muawiyah. And it is uh, evident that for last many years, for approximately uh, 20 years or so, um, he was the uh, entire ruler of that entire area of Levant, uh, Muawiyah. So naturally he has inculcated and he has put the seeds of hatred towards Banu Hashim at Amir al-Mu'mineen during his reign. So now in that situation, Imam al-Mujtaba is assuming the position of Khalifatul Muslimin. But at the same time, looking at the past four, four and a half years during which Amir al-Mu'mineen was Imam, if you see, there were three major battles or wars he had to go through. So, so now keep this in your mind that majority of people who are alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen Although it's another, another very important thing to discuss that who are those people and after the battle of Naharwan, who remained with Imam Ali or who remained with Imam al-Mushtaba to, 
to be ready to fight uh, the army of Levant. But at the same time, it is important to understand that Imam al-Mujtaba, when he is assuming this office and he is facing the challenge. Now, when he wants people to get ready to uh, uproot this fitna, many of them, they, they are passive. They don't want to fight. And if there is, there is a notion of fighting, that fighting is not for the love of Imam al-Mujtaba, but it was uh, their own hatred towards, for their own political reasons, it was uh, their desire to, to get engaged in a fight with Muawiyah and uh, not necessarily they have any reverence for Imam al-Mujtaba. In fact, they did not because they, they fought against his father, they fought against Amir al-Mu'mineen. So now if they want Imam al-Mujtaba to fight Muawiyah or the army of Levant, they, they want him just to just to fight. So once their goals are achieved, and those people who are called Khawarij, so they 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 were among the army or the people who wanted to assist Imam al mushtaba and then there were people who are just there for the tribal reasons because uh, their tribe uh, they have decided to go against Muawiyah with uh, Imam al mushtaba so they were forced, but they did not have any emotional attachment or any, any reasonable thing to stand uh, on the side of Imam al-Mushtaba. And very similarly, there was a group of people who, who, who were in, in the hope of the war booties. So they, they wanted to have Ghanaim. And, and we saw that, that when uh, there were rumors that this uh, peace agreement is going to be achieved, their hopes for Ghanaim, they, they were lost. So they tried to loot the camp of Imam Hassan, Imam Hassan alayhi salatu So we see them. So in that situation, when you see this uh, peace agreement, which was presented by Imam, and one very important aspect uh, uh, connected to your question is the way this peace agreement was presented to Imam al-Mushtaba. So there was no one-to-one one-on-one uh, -on -one negotiations between Imam al-Mushtaba and Muawiyah, no. So you can assume that how much power of Imam al-Mushtaba was understood in the minds of Banu Umayyah that when Muawiyah sends this uh, document uh, for stipulations to be written upon, he sends with his own people in a black letter and he said that there was a seal the seal of Muawiyah was already there. So he had no offense or objection, whatever Imam al-Mushtaba writes in. So now when we look at these stipulations, as you have heard, there are some very important conditions presented by Imam al-Mushtaba. And those conditions, they tell us that he is paving the way of uprising of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. And keep in your mind the famous hadith, of the Prophet of Islam, in which he says, uh, Al Hassan wal Hussein, Imama, Qama, or Qaada. So both of them, they are equally Imams, no matter they are uprising or they are, they are making a peace treaty or they are sitting down. So, so Imam al Mushtaba keeping that strategy in his mind that now there is a need to unveil or uncover the face of Banu Umayyah in front of people. And Muawiyah, who was uh, pretending himself to be a very good Muslim. And this is one of the things which we need to understand when we'll talk about the decision of Imam al-Hussein to have uprising. The conduct of uh, Muawiyah in his uh, apparent sense was not against Islam. So as Sheikh Mahdi, he, he mentioned that he was so powerful if he used to ask people to pray Salatul Jum'ah on Wednesday, people will be doing that and people were doing that. But one very important point is very important to understand there that he is asking them to pray Salat. But we look at the conduct of Yazid, he, he does not care about Salat. He does not care about Islam. So now Imam al-Mushtaba has to adopt a strategy in which he has to uncover the true face of Banu Umayyah, how they are hypocritically pretending to be uh, the, the Muslims. And the challenge they had 
because they know that majority of Muslims, they are aware of the ahadith, as I said in the beginning, that people are aware of the ahadith of the Prophet regarding the successorship, and they are hoping Imam al-Mujtaba to be the successor after the fourth caliph for them, uh, they, they were not uh, very much receptive to Muawiyah's caliphate. So when Imam Ali Salatu Salam writes the conditions on that paper, some of the conditions are very important to understand. When he talks about that uh, Muawiyah will rule his rulership, he will be mindful of the ruling in, according to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. It is very important that he is uncovering the face of Muawiyah. In other words, he's saying that he will not by default rule or have his authority over the Muslims, whatever authority he's going to have will be according to Quran and Sunnah. So I am the one who is the representative of Quran and Sunnah. So this is very important point and uh, Muawiyah accepting that shows that he was not trying to establish the government in the name of Quran and according to the teachings of Sunnah. So That's great, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muslim Shola. I, my question is this. So you're claiming that um, the reason for uh, Imam Hassan and Mushtaba um, making decision to make an agreement uh, with Muawiyah and certain, based on certain condition, conditions were two things. Number one, not having great companions, not having loyal, faithful companions like Imam Hussein did in Karbala. And number one, more importantly, the society, the society that was ruled, the people that were ruled by Muawiyah were not awakened. They were ignorant. And the ignorant was used in the favor of Muawiyah, uh, the ruler of that time. Uh, my question from Sheikh Mahdi Talib is this. Some people imagine um, whether this mis misconception is very uh, prevailing. It's that if Imam Hussein alayhi salam was the leading Imam uh, in front of Muawiyah, would have he taken the similar steps or would have he fought uh, in a battlefield with swords against Muawiyah? Uh, or if Imam Hassan al Mushtaba was there in Karbala as the leading Imam, uh, would have the tra would the tragedy in Karbala took place, or no? Um, is is there any way to draw any sort of uh, difference between the approach of these two Imam? Uh, after the Imam Imam al Mushtaba alayhi salatu wasalam accepted this uh, peace agreement. Uh, he was in a majlis, you know, the, the, the uh, companions and followers of the Imam have, have, gathered, have gathered around him. And they were questioning his action. They were questioning his decision. Why is it that you have accepted this uh, agreement? And some of them started speaking back to the Imam to the extent that Imam al Hussein stood up والسلام, and answered them. Meaning that Imam al Hussein and Imam al Mushtaba went to this agreement together. This is just an example. Now, to explain why and how, let me go one step further back. And because our time is limited, I'm trying to cut a lot of uh, details and just. Uh, um, mentioned important points. We know that in Islam, we want an Islamic government. Why? Because the whole philosophy of the coming of the, uh, the prophets is that to establish a government and bring justice and uh, enable people to enjoy this world as it was created for them. So the prophet of Allah he also wants to bring people to this point that they need a government and they have to achieve that government to establish justice, to uphold all the good values and let people enjoy a good life. Okay, but one thing is the legitimacy of the government. The other thing is for people to accept this idea and to be able to sacrifice for it and fight for it. So, 
we know that the government of Imam al-Mushtaba has that legitimacy, but if it's not accepted by people, we cannot, we won't be able to have that Islamic government. So as you see, the Imam is after establishing that universal government, either by himself or by Imam al Hussein or Imam al sajjad or anyone else. The goal is, is establishing that, that universal government to free people. And this step that the Imam takes is because he wants to get the Muslim Ummah one step closer to that universal government. As a dear Sheikh beautifully mentioned, that the people didn't know the reality of the government of Bani Umayyah. They thought they're good people, they're Muslims. To the extent that when they say, come and pray on, on Wednesday, they accept it. Even the people of Kufa, the people who lived under the government of Amir al mumini they didn't know. They didn't know Muawiyah well. For them to fight with Muawiyah, they thought, okay, Ali is the caliph, Khalifa, and he wants to fight with the Khawarij, those who uh, have gone against the government of the caliph of Muslims. What is the reality of that government? We don't know. There are also Muslims, but just because they went against the caliph for fighting them. By accepting this peace agreement, Imam al mushtaba gave people time to understand the reality of many Umayyad. The same people who were happy, because the majority of people were happy. After years of fighting, years of fighting with uh, Bani Umayyah, finally, Muslim Umar are, are at peace. But now they start to realize who they are. Imam al mushtaba was martyred by the order of Muawiyah. He was poisoned, and Imam, Imam al-Hussein is there. And now people have started sending letters. When? When Muawiyah dies. And Yazid starts showing the reality, the core of the government of Bani Umayyah. Uh, they never had the intention of giving, of handing over the government to Imam al-Mushtawa. But Muslims believed it. They made a mistake when they accepted the judgment of Abu Musa Ash'ari and uh, Abdul Da'as at the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Muawiyah. A lot of them became Khawarij. They said, we accepted the judgment of anyone other than Allah. Therefore, everyone is kafir. I mean, you're, you're a kafir. Muawiyah is a kafir. We're a kafir. We repented. And Ali, you have to repent too. Let me have a moment told them, I'm not a kafir. I didn't accept the judgment. You forced me to. I'm the Imam of Quran and not the, I'm the, the Quran that speaks to people. People have to realize and wake up. From the time of Amin al muminin all the way to the time of Imam al mushtaba all the, all the way to the time of Imam al-Hussein, now the government of Muawiyah, Bani Umayyah, are slowly showing the core, the, re, the, the, the hidden aspects and the reality of what they want. They want power. They want to rule over people just for the sake of power. And Imam al mushtaba the Ahlul Bayt, they don't want power. They want to bring justice for people. They want to teach people the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to free people from the chains of the shahawats and desires. Therefore, at the time of um, Muawiyah, at the end of the time of Muawiyah when he dies, people will start sending letters to Imam al Hussein. Yes, if Imam al Hussein was at the time of, was the leading Imam, as you mentioned, at the time of Imam al Mushtaba, he would have done the same thing. Because at that time, they did not have those people around them, the acceptance of people and enough faithful people to be with them to fight. Let me just give you one example <clears throat> and move on. The only Ahlul Bayt have always been waiting for a good number of people to fight back and you know uh, turn the resistance to a level that's going to uh, move towards establishing governments faster. At the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, as history says, you know, um, the children of Imam al mushtaba they started fighting against Bani Umayyah. Bani Abbas, they also started fighting against Bani Umayyah. And 
they thought that it's their time to establish a government because Bani Omeya is gone weak. And now it's time with the help of Bani Abbas, we can, you know, topple them and take over the government. They want to know Imam Asad, told them, no, this is not our time and this won't be our government. This is not our time and this won't be our government. Meaning that Bani Abbas will use you and once they win, once they get rid of Bani Umayyah, they will start killing each and every one of you. Why is it that the Imam is not moving towards establishing a government? After uh, the leader of this movement, Al-Tanabah goes to Imam and says, even Abu Musa al-Khurasani is with us. He has an army from Khurasan. They can come, they can join us, and we can establish the Islamic government. Imam al tells him, are you sure about Abu Musa? Are you sure about the army of Abu Musa? Okay, say we fight alongside with these people. What happens after we win? Will they listen to us? Will they be our people? The problem is that their ideology is different. They weren't taught the right Islam. Therefore, we cannot count on them. Therefore, this is not our time, and this won't be our, our government. We need good followers to come, and based on the good followers, we inshallah come, and this is what the Imam of, of our time is also waiting for. And inshallah, if this happens, we will be able to establish that government. Everything that the Imams did, Everything, everything that the Prophet of Allah, Amir al muminin Imam al mushtaba all the way to Imam al hujjah everything that we did during this time, uh, about 260, 70 years, was to establish a network, make that move, movement strong, make people understand, give them good teachings, make them wake up, and then inshallah go for that uh, government and fighting with the enemies of Islam. Thank you so much, Sheikh Mahdi. Very good points. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are all, uh, I believe, learning. I myself am learning lots, uh, Alhamdulillah, today uh, from you and Sheikh Muslim Shola. Um, Sheikh Muslim, how do you draw the difference between the companions of Imam al mushtaba and Imam Hussein alayhi salam? And uh, also, uh, we know that Imam Hassan al mushtaba was uh, poisoned by his wife while Imam Hussain alayhi salam had um, family members that were ready to stay on the line with him, alongside with him in Karbala and sacrifice all they have for the path of Islam. Why is it that, can we relate that to why Imam Mushtaba is less known even within the Shias and is uh, less studied um, amongst the Shias as well. What, what, why do we call, why is it that Imam al-Mushtaba is more gharib uh, amongst us? Um, do you, what do you think? Share us your thoughts, please. Yeah, sure. Um, um, actually, I will, I will answer your second question first, that why Imam al-Mushtaba is gharib among us. So uh, naturally, this is a very important question because when we look at the commemoration of the martyrdom of Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada, we see that, uh, alhamdulillah, year after year, we are commemorating that at a greater scale. And nowadays, I think there is no part of the universe where you don't see anyone uh, commemorating for Sayyid al-Shuhada or mourning for him. And 10 days of uh, Majalis and then Arba'een we do not see the similar kind of observation for Imam al-Mushtaba or other Imams as well. So in terms of Imam al-Mushtaba, uh, I would say for a long period of time, uh, and I would confess that this is returning back to uh, the people who came to the pulpit as well, not to educate people properly because people are always under the uh, impression of negative propaganda. Uh, as Sheikh Mehdi, I was uh, referring to some of the historical accounts which took place during the life of Imam al-Mujtaba. That was the reason throughout the history of Umayyah, it was 
their main motive and goal to undermine the personality of Imam al-Mujtaba. And from the very first day, uh, Ali Umayyah had a greater, and then Ali Abbas as well. So Banu Abbas as well, they had a greater amount of animosity, especially to Imam al-Mujtaba. So the historians, they were, they were writing against them because uh, historians were connected to, to the Khulafa and the court. And naturally after that, the, the contemporary times where we see the Orientalists and Occidents, they are writing the books. They, they have done same thing, character assassination of Imam al-Mujtaba. So for, for not encountering that strategy of the enemies of Islam, Unfortunately, we, we had to face this challenge that our communities, our youth uh, are not much aware of the personality and the role and the contribution of Imam al-Mujtaba. And part of that, the negative propaganda sometimes, uh, and that is going on through the, throughout the history, sometimes that he did not make the bravest of the choices and Imam al Hussein he decided to be killed. Whereas people, they are forgetful, or I would say, ignorant, most of them, they are ignorant to the bravery displayed by Imam al-Mujtaba in the battles of Sifin and Naharawan. And uh, uh, on all the occasions, when you, when you see even in Sifin, uh, when Imam uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to get the control of water, so he is appointing the group of people under the command of Imam al-Mujtaba. So most of the times the, the apologetic um, opinion or apologetic style of uh, the people not to remember in, in Imam al-Mujtaba is due to that mindset that he did not make the bravest or the best of the choices, which uh, alhamdulillah with this session and with the other sessions, it is of utmost importance that we should highlight the characteristic of Imam al-Mujtaba and we should realize that uh, the character wise or the strategy wise or or, or the way both of these Imams, they have implemented the teachings of Islam, uh, they are equally important personalities. So this was the answer of your second question. And the first question which you have asked, it is indeed very important that if we were to draw a comparison between the companions of Imam al Hussein and Imam al Mustaba, indeed we, we have a hadith uh, or a saying attributed to Imam uh, al Hussein al Shaheed. Uh, he says that the companions which Allah has graced me with, uh, my father, my brother, or my grandfather did not have those companions. Although th those were very handful, very limited number of the companions, but all of them, they were wholeheartedly submissive to the Imam of their time. So when we talk about the companions of Imam al-Mujtaba, there were uh, the true Shias among his companions. But if we look at the factions, we see that there were some, and that is again, uh, returning back to the time in which he was living. So right after the martyrdom of Amir al-Mu'mineen, many of the uh, greater companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, they, they got martyred over the period of time. And then in the battles before that, so now he has a handful of the people with him and rest they are betraying him. And at the same time, when we look at the number of the people who came to Karbala, and we should not be forgetful of the companions who were in prisons or who were house arrested in Kufa and other places, or who did not join Imam al Hussein due to other legitimate reasons, we should not forget them as well. But the companions who came in Karbala with Imam al Hussein, they were the purest one to extend where we see that uh, a night before Ashura when Imam is asking them to leave the battlefield uh, if they wanted to, no one left the battlefield. So it definitely draws uh, a comparison in between the people who are around Imam al-Mushtaba and people who are around Imam al Hussein. So now the people around Imam al Mushtaba, so they were in great numbers and they had their hidden motives. So we cannot say all of them, they were Shias or they were the true followers of Imam al Imam al Mujtaba. So sometimes it is uh, quite mistakenly understood that the Shias of Imam al Hassan betrayed him. No, it's, it's not true. So we, we know that there were people among them who, who used to consider 
three caliphs as the legitimate rulers and did not have faith in Imam Ali as the caliph. We had people who had faith in, in, in four caliphs, but not in the third caliph, one, two, and three. So, and they used to be called Alawis. So, and then we have the very small number of the companions of Imam al mustaba So it is indeed very important to draw a comparison in between the companions of Imam al mustaba and that Ghorba which you are referring to is somehow attributed to that time where uh, not even the family members who are inside the house are not trustworthy. So it, it really reflects the heartbreaking Ghorba and loneliness of Imam al mustaba as well. Thank you so much for your input, uh, Sheikh Muslim uh, Shola. It's uh, really um, thought-provoking. Um, some of the audience have sent some questions. Shola, we try to answer them along the lines of our discussions. Sheikh Mahdi, let's go back to Qom. Let's go turn to Qom. Uh, our hearts are there. Um, Sheikh Mahdi, uh, what do you think about uh, the contemporary issues, our current conditions today? Uh, what lessons uh, are we supposed to drive uh, from, uh, to learn from the peace agreement of Imam Hassan alayhi salam? And how should we deal with the tyrant uh, leading um, the world today? How should we uh, compare current situations or uh, current lives with uh, the times of Imam al-Mushtaba? Are we in the times of Imam al-Mushtaba or are we in the times of Imam al Hussein? Where are we standing today? Um, are the enemies of these two Imam al-Mujahid, these two Imams are still alive, their thoughts and their approach and their, their uh, ideologies are still alive or not? Um, our Imam of time um, is more the condition that he's in right now is closer to the condition of Imam al-Mushtaba or Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Um, what are the differences um, share us your thoughts on this matter, please. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying we are in our own time. We're not in the time of Imam al-Mushtaba. We're not in the time of Imam al-Hussain, alayhi salatu wassalam. We are in our own time. And we have to see what this time is and what our responsibility is. Meaning that uh, the Imams... You can imagine all of these imams as just one individual who has lived throughout the history and who's done different things based on different tactics and based on the people of the time, based on their enemies, based on what the time has changed. So that one individual has lived throughout the time from that time up to now and based on the necessities of the time, based on the requirements of that time, uh, they reacted and they showed uh, response to the events, to the um, occurring, to the events occurring, in the Muslim Ummah and in the world. Let me go one step back and start from my previous talk, and inshallah, connect to what your question was about. You see. It's all about establishing that final government in This earth, the whole entire earth will be inherited by the righteous men and women. The final government has to be there. And this is uh, what all the prophets wanted. And this is what our prophet wanted. And this is what all the Ahlul Bayt and Imam wanted. And this is what the Imam of our time wants. So, they were trying to educate people. And from time to time, people were failing. As I mentioned, the hadith in Usul al Kafi, which is one of the, or the, either the most important books or between the four more, most important books of Shia, hadith says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set the time for the final government to be the year 70. But people had shortcomings. After Imam al Hussein started his uprising, his movements against the government of his time, against the cruel government of his time, people didn't follow him well. We cannot say whether he, he started his movement to achieve a government at that time or to become Shani based on 
uh, you know, there is a disagreement between ulama and historians whether he wanted the government or he just thought that he's, you know, he doesn't have anything, I mean, any other tools other than giving his life to, you know, fight and, you know, show people something. No, he wanted to, you know, start um, waking people up and do amr wal ma'ruf wa nahi ala munkar to invite people to good and show them this is the right thing and you have to wake up. But people still had shortcomings. Although they had sent him letters, although they had seen the reality of the government, although they had seen the, 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 the oppression, the clear oppression of the government, they know this government is, a, is an oppressive government. They had no doubt that Yazid, Muawiyah, Bani, Bani Umayya, they're not good people. They don't care about Islam, they don't care about justice, they don't care about anyone's rights. They just want the government and the power within the government. After realizing it, realizing this, they remained silent. So after Imam al Mushtab, after Imam al Hussein was martyred, there's another hadith in Usul al Kafi, volume uh, number one, that says, uh, page 368, that says, uh, once Imam al Hussein was martyr, martyred, after Imam al Hussein was murdered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became angry. Even angrier from before, he, he was more angry. And the result was that, that he postponed the final government, the universal government, to year uh, 140. And Ghazab of Allah means that he deprived them. He deprived them from having a good life, which only could which could only be achievable through the final government, through that universal government. You see? Now bring what happened there to other periods of time, the time of Imam al-Sadiq, the time of Imam al-Qadim, the time of Imam al-Rada, um, Imam al and now we still are fighting the same battle to wake people up. From day one of this creation, we had the shaitan here and the army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the other side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his come and his followers on one side, shaitan and his followers on the other side. Throughout the history, we had the Ayama of Islam. Prophets, Ahlul Bayt, Ahma. And we had the Ahma of Tawud, Pharaoh, Pharaoh at this time, Namrud at this time, Bani Umayyah at their time. And today, obviously, the government of the United States, Israel, and their allies. We clearly say they're the government of Shaitan, the system of Shaitan, not the people. We are at peace with American people. We're at peace with um, the people wherever they are. But the system and the government, no, that's the government of Ta'ut. And people have to realize, you see what's happening in America right now? That people are fighting for justice because they're realizing something is going on. 99% of the wealth of this country is going for just 1% of this society. People have to pay taxes from their own pockets. They work hard, they get paid very little, and they have to pay taxes to do what? For that tax to go and be spent in Israel for the security and safety and protection of Israel, which is the core of corruption. As Quran says, and we clearly say this, and all the movements and believers have to focus on this ayah. You will find the most hostile of the enemies towards you, the Yahud, the Jews. If I want to say which part of the Jews, today it's Israel and the, the Israeli lobby, which is controlling America, which is oppressing the world. Now, as Muslims, we see this. Non-Muslims, they see this. They have to wake up. They have to understand what's going on. Republicans, Democrats, it's just a game. 
It's just a game. When they come to debate one another, they start saying things about each other. I know if you remember the debates between Trump and Clinton, they said things about each other that could clearly show the reality of the leaders of the, New York, of the United States right now. And it's a shame for the people, for the good people of the United States to have leaders like Trump, like Clinton, like Biden, like all the other politicians in America. This is a shame. They go trying to invade this country and other country and trying to eat whatever they have under the name of freedom and democracy. Well, we know it's a game. You're not going to rock for democracy. My, my, my friends were there in the US Army. You're not there for democracy and freedom. One soldier told me, told me that we had a teacher that used to teach us the language that people speak in that area in Iraq. Once they were finished with the teacher, they just killed the teacher because the teacher had come to our base and she knows things. We have to kill him now. Are you trying to bring justice and peace and freedom for people by killing them? On the other side, they also have what Moavia had at that time, which is media. Today we call it media. At that time, they had member To fabricate things, they had Abu Huraira at that time. Go on the member, lie, fabricate a hadith. Today, they have CNN, they have Fox News, they have other channels, they have the social media. If you go on Twitter and if you want to say anything against them, they block you. They suspend your account because you can't say anything against them and you cannot try to wake people up. If you say anything on YouTube, and how many times they've removed the account of Press TV on YouTube? Just name it, just count it. Where's, where are the accounts of Press TV on YouTube? Where are the accounts of Press TV on Google? They've blocked their Gmail. Everything they could, they could do, they've done it. Why? Because they don't want people to hear the truth. And once people hear the truth, they try to manipulate and play with people. Some of them come and support people, some of them on the other side. They send their agents between people and corrupt again, bring corruption again. This is what they do. This is what they're good at. And they fight with the one and only, only Islamic government, which is established in Iran. We believe that the government in, in Iran belongs to all the free people around the world, not only Iranians. Imam Khomeini, once he started his movement as a continuation of the movement of the Ahmed Bayt, to achieve that government that we spoke about uh, previously, he said that this government for, is for all the mustadafin, for all the oppressed all around the globe, not only for the Iranian people. We are holding the flag of justice and we're going to fight with the tyrannies of our time, the tyrants of our time. What is our responsibility today? Our responsibility today is to get educated, to know the reality of the, of the powers, of the so-called superpowers. What is America doing in the Middle East? We have an entity called Israel. They've gone to a country, they've bought their lands, some of their lands, and through their force, through, through their power, uh, the, the power of their military, through the political power that they've received from Britain, uh, British government and some other governments, they force Palestinians to move to two corners and they established the so-called government. Isn't this called, isn't this uh, a clear act of occupation? If, it's, if this is not occupation, then what is occupation? You go to a country, you occupy that country, and you bring another flag by force, and you call your friends and families and relatives from all around the globe to, hey, come in, now we have, we have a government. That is the government of Shaitan. That is the government of Satan. And, and yes, they are afraid of the government of Iran because the government of Iran today is holding the flag of justice, and they're not let go, and, and the government of Iran won't let go of them Wherever they are, wherever there's Israel, there will be Iran as well. Wherever there is 
the, the oppression of Israel on people, there will be Iran as well fighting with Israel, whether it is in Palestine, whether it is in Lebanon, whether it is, it is in, in Yemen, whether it is in Africa, wherever they are, the government of Iran and the people of Iran will be there as well. And right now, it's not only the people of Iran anymore. It's the hearts of millions of people of, all around the world was with Iran. It's interesting to know that once uh, the war between Saddam and Iran started, which wasn't a war between Iran and Iran, it was a war between Saddam, which who was backed by, by America, Israel, and other um, allies they had. Once, once Saddam started a war against Iran, when Saddam attacked Iran, A lot of people in Pakistan went to the Iranian embassy asking them to send them to Iran to fight. Why? If it's a fight between Iran and Iraq, why do you want to come and fight here? Because they knew that this is not a fight between Iran and Iraq. It's a fight between Islam and Kufr. It's a fight between Saddam and Islam. It's a fight between America, Israel, and Saddam, and the people of Iraq, Iran, and the rest of the believers of the world. Thank you so much, Sheikh Mahdi. It's uh, really great um, and eye-opening, the points that you have made. Uh, really blessed to have this discussion and everything is going great based on the comments of the people, uh, the audience that are reflecting. Sheikh Muslim, uh, Shola, let's go to Virginia again. Um, where do you think we are standing today? U.S. election is coming up. Um, we are about to make a decision. Some people uh, are worried about the uh, condition of Muslims uh, post US election around the world, in the United States and around the world. What do you think we should learn from uh, the history of Islam, particularly the history of the life of Imam al-Mushtaba alayhi salam, to learn uh, where should we stand today? Your microphone is off, Sheikh Mahdi. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the message which is applicable to our lives, I would say that as we just have said that a pavement of the path to the successful government or successful leadership of Islam as Imam al-Mustaba did, uh, I would like to draw your attentions towards a couple of sayings of Imam al Hussein, because as um, we just have discussed, that it was an ongoing process of Imams to establish the values of justice and values of Islam. So, uh, very clearly, Imam Hussein, when he is uh, departing from Medina, he is uh, giving as a piece of his will to his brother. And he explains the purpose of his uprising in that. I think that would be very relevant for us in this day and age, uh, in addition to what is uh, just said, that he says that in ilam akhruj asharan wala bataran wala zaliman wala mufsidan, bal innama kharajtu li tulabi islah fi ummati jaddi. Wa uridu an amura bil ma'aruf anha anil mulka. Wa asira bi sirati jaddi wa abi. So two points are key points here in my personal view in terms of learning lesson from the movement of Imam Hussein and the effort of Imam Al-Mujtaba because those 20 years, it is also very crucial to understand that when we talk about the uprising of Imam Hussein, it did not take place right after the uh, martyrdom of Imam Al-Mujtaba. So it tells us that there was a process Therefore, we, we have to be careful about uh, having any judgment for the imams that actually imam was waiting for that moment where Batil's face is uncovered. And he can say now that I am uprising against the injustice, first of all, and I am rising against the distortions in the religion. So he says that, Uridun amra bil ma'ruf anha anil mulka. So this is one of the key points of Imam Hussein's uprising, which is relevant to us in this day and age, that wherever we see uh, injustice, any 
any uh, monker, any any vice. So we we have a responsibility to first of all disassociate ourselves from that, and then ask other people to to be away from that vice. And very similarly, amr bil ma'roof, whatever is good, joining people regardless of their faith, their creed, their ethnicity, their background, wherever you find someone, you have to enjoin them for good and you have to forbid them from the evil. So I personally see this as one of the greatest of the messages of Imam Hussein, alayhi salatu salam to us and his patience to, to, to find a right time and right uh, strategy to rise against the injustice because now Yazid who has stood in front of him. And this is one of the important elements as well because when we compare in between the strategies of Imam al mustaba and Imam al Hussein, we see Muawiyah did not force uh, Imam al mustaba to pledge his allegiance. And as um, uh, Sheikh Taib said, and I agree with that, I have not seen anywhere that Imam Hassan pledged his allegiance to Muawiyah. Rather, he, he spared him. So, but when we look at the letter written by Yazid uh, to the governor of Medina, it was clearly mentioning that you need to uh, take the bayah or allegiance forcefully, otherwise you have to kill him. So now the face of the tyrant was very clear in front of people and the duration of 20 years was there for people to understand that who is right and who is wrong. And uh, uh, almost 18,000 people, they wrote letters to Imam to invite him. So I, I think how I would relate that to our time that yes, we are waiting for a savior for the time to come where we can, we can uh, join his movement, but for that we have to first of all get ready in terms of our preparation of cleansing our souls because Imam Sayyid Shuhara has said, Anasu Abidu Dunya. So if we are so attached to this world and we cannot disassociate ourselves from the luxuries of this world and our character is not pious, no matter whatever we utter from our words, if our being our, our character is not strength and we might not be able to assist him. Therefore, when we, we call upon him that, oh Imam, we are waiting for you and we want to be uh, alongside you to fight injustice, we have to be very careful that if we are true and truthful in that calling upon Imam or not. And that cannot be achieved unless or until we purify ourselves spiritually and we make ourselves enlightened through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and through the teachings of Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Thank you so much, Sheikh Muslim. Uh, thank you for your input. Uh, Sheikh Mahdi, um, I repeat my question that I asked uh, from Sheikh uh, Muslim. And that is, uh, this is one of the questions that the audience have asked us um, in the um, Slido. And that is, uh, they said, how do you foresee uh, the condition of Muslims in post elections uh, around the world, especially uh, the U.S. election that is coming up. Um, and if you have um, anything to add as your closing statement, we'll be honored, honored inshallah, to hear that. Um, first of all, a lot of people ask me whether we should vote or not. Um, I will tell them your vote is not going to change anything. Voting for Trump or Clinton, voting for Trump or Biden, voting for this one or the other one, the problem in America is the system. As Shaheed Malcolm Malcolm X, may Allah um, elevate his station in his paradise and um, make him the guest of the twelve, the the the, 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 the Prophet and Sayyid al-Shuhada tonight. As Shaheed Malcolm X beautifully stated, the whole piping system is messed up. The American system, the American government. It's based on corruption and occupation. They've occupied those lands. They've taken those lands unjustly and they have established the government. Okay, put that aside. Now there's a government. 
but the government and the system is messed up. So the whole piping system is messed up. You cannot change one piece and say, okay, the president has changed and now everything will be all right. Nothing will be all right. There's no difference between Trump and Biden. Both of them will, will, will rage war. Both of them are warmongers. Both of them will pressure you and will deprive you from your rights. Both of them will violate people's rights all around the world because they misuse power because of their view towards the government. They want the government for its power. They don't want government to bring peace, justice, and human rights to people. They don't want the government. They, they don't look at the government this way. Just, I mean, look at what uh, Trump said in the previous um, um, debates. He's one of the richest guys in, in, in the country. And, and look at how much tax he has paid till now. He ordered for the general who did not only belong to Iran, but belonged to the whole line of resistance to the people of this nation, to all the free people and, and the oppressed people around the globe, he ordered that commander to be killed directly. And he is the first general who was killed by the hands of Americans from the Islamic government after the Islamic government directly. He has deprived people from having their basic rights in America. Look at what uh, this coronavirus has done to America and what Trump and their system have done. They won't do anything for the people. Why? Because they have to remain rich and people have to work and make them richer. They won't do anything for you. They won't do. And to think that, okay, Democrats are such and the Republicans are such, therefore, if they come, you know, they lessen the pressure on us. If they, those people come, they will, you know, pressure us more. This is just a mistake. The whole system is pressuring you today. The whole system is um, based on injustice. What do we have to do as Muslims in America? What do we have to do as Muslims in uh, non-Muslim countries in, uh, under the government of Tawhul? First of all, we should never ever go against the law of the land. We as Muslims, wherever we live, we live we respect the law of the land. If you go to a country, we respect the law of that land. That's one. And if we're born in a country and we're Muslims and the government is not an Islamic government, yet we respect the law of the land. Two, we have to think about our lifestyles. The government to, to rule over you, to make you weak, to keep you weak, to keep you in a corner, not able to do anything, they, they have focused on your lifestyle. Once you're uh, tied down through your lifestyle, you won't be able to do anything. You won't be able to, to, help, to help the imam. You won't be able to take part in the coming of the imam. You won't be able to take part in the, in the final and in the universal government. All the movies that, the, that the Hollywood is making, the toys, the food, everything, your lifestyle. Sometimes I see some of the Muslim brothers and sisters, they, they uh, send posts on different social media saying, proud American. Uh, if you're proud of the people, okay, but if you're proud of the government of America, of that flag, which is not the flag of the people, it's the flag of the system. I don't know how proud you are and you call yourself a Muslim. I know why you say that, because you haven't studied Islam, because you haven't studied the teachings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down for me and you to read, in which we can find justice, peace, tranquility, and inshallah, inshallah, everything that was meant to receive inshallah through. We have to get educated, change our lifestyle, and put fear aside, Definitely put fear aside. Why is it that we see right now um, the, and the BLM movement, a lot of people are out there. They're not afraid. They fight for their rights. Don't go against the law, just peacefully. They try to call the, 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 the protesters looters, but they are the real looters. They're not violating anyone's rights. However, I know that they will use this they try to use this in their own benefit, but they plan on a law plan, plan
plans and things might change and go out of control. How I see the future is that, first of all, Muslims have to wake up, have to understand the reality of the enemies of Islam and the reality of Islam. What we repeat in Ziyarat Ashura is this, We are friends with your friends and enemies of your enemies. Oh, the Prophet of Allah, oh, the Ahlul Bayt, oh, the messengers of God, all the prophets, we are friends with your friends. If there are friends of the Prophet of the prophets, we're friends with them. If there are enemies of the prophets of Allah, we're enemies with them. Okay, this requires, this requires certain things. This has certain prerequisites to it. And the most important one is to know who are the friends and who are the enemies. If you don't know who the friends are, if you don't know who the friends of the Imam al-Hujjah are, and who the enemies of the Imam al-Hujjah are, you won't be able to be friends with them. Therefore, you might be sitting at home, repeating this line over and over, crying, thinking that you are a good guy, trying to help the imam of your time. You are against injustice. Well, the fact of the matter is, you are in the puzzle of the enemies. You're acting the way they want. We have to try to separate ourselves from their media, from the propaganda, from what they're trying to place in our minds. Find the teachings of the 12th imam. And inshallah, practice them. And inshallah, make ourselves ready. So the first thing is to get educated, to get ready, and not get intimidated. Don't fear anything. And inshallah, inshallah, move towards um, being friends with the friends of the imam, knowing who they are, and being friends with them, and being at war with those who are the, uh, the enemies of the prophets. And inshallah, if this happens, you see, if you as Muslims start this, if you understand what's going on, then you will see others will join you. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Sheikh Mahdi. Um, they will come to you in large group. Non-Muslims will join you. And inshallah, we we'll can say that we'll pave the ground for the coming of the Imam inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, please, please remember all of us, uh, if you got the chance to visit the shrine of Lady Fatima Asuma in Qom. Uh, let's turn to uh, Sheikh Muslim Shola. Uh, it's, uh, we got a couple more minutes left. Uh, very briefly, if you have anything to share with us and enlighten us on your closing statement, we'll be grateful to that. Jazakallah. Thank you very much for uh, once again. And uh, as I just have said earlier, that our role is very important where whatever time we are living in, it has its own requirements. And uh, uh, all the prophets and imams, they have set guidelines for us. So we, we have to see that what strategy we have to take during the time we are living in and the place where we are living at. So, and we should not be uh, fooled by people how they are covering themselves and here, uh, uh, because uh, we, we talked about the tactics of Banu Umayya. We, we see very similarly uh, acting uh, Mideastern countries now uh, getting along with the enemies uh, of humanity and then accepting them and going along with them. So those things are very prevalent for us, uh, but it requires us to be, uh, first of all, educated enough and strong enough and having faith enough in Allah and the values of Islam and Quran by purifying ourselves, by making ourselves aware of the situation in which we are and taking heed from the guidance uh, from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, uh, because very eloquently it is said, and uh, Atullah Khamenei in his book, he explains it very well that uh, don't look at Imamat as one Imam or two Imam. It's the whole process, as you see at uh, a man of 250 years or 200 or some years old man. So every Imam has a guidance for us since we are uh, the people of end of the time, Akhir Zaman. So we might not be uh, just um, restricted to the strategy adopted by Imam al Mujtaba or the strategy adopted by Imam al Qadim or a, a strategy adopted by Imam Ali, 
maybe the, the entirety and wholesomely we have to face all the challenges which were faced by imams individually at their times. So we see that the challenges in the society uh, around us, wherever we are living or wherever we see around the world what is happening. So uh, the, the practice of imams uh, in, in its entirety is in front of us. So th that's what I would say that um, uh, practicing piety and, and pondering upon the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and driving lessons from that, not from the secular or liberalistic values, but uh, the values which Islam and our religion has taught us will be very helpful for us to, to survive and prosper. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Muslim. Uh, may Allah bless you for your time and your presents. Uh, oh, Sheikh Mahdi, do you have anything to add and inshallah close uh, this program? It's all yours. Um, at the end, I would like to uh, say a few words with my brothers and sisters uh, who participated took part in this majlis, online majlis in this meeting, that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise and he will never ever fail his promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that this earth will be inherited by the righteous men and women. This earth will be ours. It belongs to the followers of the truth. It belongs to Ashab al-Haq. It belongs to Ashab al-Hujjah. It belongs to us. Brothers and sisters, a dunya sajnu al-mu'min. This world is the prison to the believers. This world is not meant to be a place where everything is fine, where you're just enjoying everything. No, you're in this world and you're moving towards Akhirah. Don't expect everything to be in a um, tasty and sweet way and for you to always enjoy everything. No, brothers and sisters, we are part of a movement. If we if we pretend that we're asleep, or if we really sleep, it doesn't change the fact that we're part of a movement. It's better to wake up, it's better to open, to, to open our eyes, it's better to get ready and prepare ourselves, because once the 12th Imam comes, you're either with him or you're against him. There's nothing in between. If you haven't made yourself ready for the coming of the Savior, think about yourself. Because once the Savior comes, you are either with the Savior or against the Savior and nothing in between. And it's interesting that when we refer to, that, to our books, we see that a lot of those who've claimed, who have claimed that they're the followers of the truth, followers of the Savior, once he comes, they also leave him. And a lot of people on the other side, they join him. They join him and they will be on his side until the day that the two armies encounter while all the people, the followers of the truth are with the savior and all the followers of kufr and blasphemy are with the leaders of Ta'wut and, and blasphemy and kufr. And once this happens, they encounter and they have that final uh, war, inshallah, and the final government will be established, inshallah. So me and you, each and every one of us, we have to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Imam and inshallah, uh, we don't want to be asleep. We don't want to um, make us look like, uh, make make ourselves look like we're asleep. We have to wake up, open our eyes, and try to do our responsibilities and our taklif. And inshallah, prove to the imams in action, prove to the savior in action that we're with you. We're with you. We're with you. Not with anyone else not with your enemies, definitely. We're always with you, and we're waiting for your Lahore, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Sheikh Mahdi. Uh, may Allah save us through the tests and tribulations, challenges of the ending times. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We recite the dua for the health and well-being of our Imam of time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih fi hadhi al-sa'a. وفي كل صاع وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أبدك توأى وتمتأه فيها 
Tawila. Inshallah, the movement of Imam al mushtaba and the movement of Imam al Hussein and the movement of Ahlul Bayt will be completed soon by the presence and leadership of our Imam of time. And inshallah, we get the chance to be his true followers and true companions. Inshallah, next week, we are going to have next Saturday, inshallah, we are going to have another panel discussion on the blasphemy from ignorance to modern ages on Saturday, 17th of October. So inshallah, join us then. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the uh, scholarly um, presence of Sheikh Mahdi Taib and Sheikh Muslim Shola. Inshallah, uh, we'll see everyone again soon. Keep us in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.